And we tend to think, oh, they will put up with all of our garbage, and maybe we even see them as an extension of ourselves. And sometimes we don't talk to ourselves all that nice. Yeah. And we do that to our partner. You're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast, where we believe that your health is the number one resource you need to accomplish your dreams. My name is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and I'm a physician dedicated to helping my patients maintain their active lifestyle and continue doing what they love. I'm sitting down with other experts so that we can provide our listeners with the knowledge they need to improve their health and live their best life. Hey, everyone. This is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and you're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast, where we are continuing our Powerful Mind series. In this particular series, we're discussing the things that you can do to help build and foster a powerful mind so that you can use focused concentration to improve multiple facets of your life. In this episode, we're really diving into the tool of hypnotherapy as a way to go and focus our minds so we can ultimately get the outcome that we're looking for. And for this series, we have a special guest, Sherry Jackson, who's a clinical hypnotherapist and owner of Envisage Wellbeing. So Sherry, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I love the momentum that we've got going here today, Matt. In episode one, we really defined what having a powerful mind is, what hypnotherapy can help you achieve, which again is that focused concentration, and ultimately how you can use that uh, in various aspects to improve different pieces of your life. Episode two, we went and discussed how you can recognize stress and some things that you can do about it. And uh, again, the reason for episode two is there's a lot of people that come into both of our offices and they're experiencing either low energy, inability to focus, inability to get through the day. And ultimately, it comes down to stress being the main aspect of what's causing those symptoms. So we wanted to give you some tools on how to recognize if you're stressed, because most people we found do not actually understand when they are stressed and they just kind of push forward. And that's great. That's something that needs to happen. But ultimately, you need to protect your energy, protect, protect yourself from being worn down over time. And that's what people aren't great at. So we wanted you to be proactive in recognizing what it looks like to be stressed and give you some tools that you can use to manage that so that you can ultimately perform at your best. And that, that episode was geared towards high performers. This episode today that we're going to be discussing, we're going to be going into you know, some of the things that, that, w- w- that we stress about are going to be issues with our relationships, issues with career, different things like that, anxiety over our health. And so ultimately, what we're going to do in these next few episodes is go over each one of these individually so that you can get some tools to help you push through any kind of anxiety, performance issues that you're having within those aspects of your life. And so today we're going to be discussing relationships and difficult conversations. You know, I think relationships really have to boil down to having difficult conversations uh, and what I like to call productive conversations around conflict, right? And so Sherry's going to share some things with us today to kind of help us understand that. This is something that I've worked a lot on personally as well, just to help me in my personal relationship with my significant other. And then also even with, you know, with patients, with employees, with my family, a bunch of different things. So everything that we're going to talk about today can be utilized in any relationship that you have. Again, a lot of the conflict that comes in relationships or a lot of the anxiety that can happen has to do around either expectations or just not agreeing with somebody. And Ultimately, one of the things that I learned from Sherry's training is that 69% of conflict is unresolvable. And when you learn and really like let that sink in, and ultimately you can kind of get empowered by that and use that to your uh, advantage and, and just realize that there's a different skill set that's needed for that. So that's what Sherry's going to discuss with us. Let's go ahead and, and jump right into that. Is there anything else outside of expectations or like just not agreeing with somebody in a re- in a relationship that could cause some tension it could do, what what are some of the common things that you've seen for for causing tension in relationships it really it comes down to if we want to simplify things matt there are two different kinds of problems in a relationship and the one that you were talking about the 69% of the problems that are not resolvable we call those perpetual problems Those are ongoing because they're rooted in differences in personality styles and beliefs. And so we can't really resolve that. What we have to do is 
find ways to manage around that and communicate around that and have the proper tools. And then the other set of problems are those problems that are, they're situational. They're a situation, they're a specific circumstance, and the problem is there's a solution that's possible. Right. So, for example, say Bob and Susan drive to work in the morning and Susan is really upset that he's speeding all the time and it makes her nervous. Bob says, you know, if you didn't take so long to get ready and I wouldn't have to speed to work. And then Susan says, well, you take too long in the shower and you don't clean up the dishes. And so I'm doing those things to to run late. So there's a solution. It's like set the alarm clock 15 minutes earlier, take a shorter shower, leave the dishes. There's all these different there's solutions to that. Problem, yeah. Right. Absolutely. So an ongoing problem might be, yo, you're you always speeding in the car and you don't respect it. I'm I'm nervous about it. And it's like, well, you just that's how I drive. And it's just these ways of communicating around and saying, you know, well, maybe I feel really nervous. Well, I didn't really realize that. And and using different tactics rather than trying to solve that problem, you're just going to get more frustrated. Yeah, I think I think going and looking at ways to manage around that at the end of the day, most people are stubborn and they're set in their ways and and that's fine. And so as, as long as you understand that really there's no change in this person's mind in those situations. And I think one recognizing when a conversation is that, when is it going to be a solvable situational problem versus a perpetual ongoing problem is going to be important. And then from there, once you recognize that, you kind of, you know, you can proceed on to the next step of is this something that we actually look to solve or is this something that we look to manage? What are some ways that you that people can take a step back and recognize this is solvable, this isn't solvable? Or even better yet, for the people that think that everything is solvable, like I did at one time, mm-hmm. how do you kind of you know, flip that switch to realize that it's not always going to happen? Fabulous question. The one thing is for us all to remember that there is the subjective reality on both parts is right. So no one is really wrong, right? right? Because we're coming down to these core beliefs. And so if you believe certain things about that, and so it comes into this, this play of, okay, where, how is the relationship as far as our friendship? Are we building our friendship? Are we spending the time on that? Do we have some fun together? Do we have, is that an area that's lacking? Because it's going to show up in these conversations, right? Do we have this shared meaning? Again, if the friendship's not there and we're not communicating, then it's likely that we don't have this common goal together. And so working on those aspects of the relationship as well. And then um, there's something what we call love maps, right? And so that's, again, when we're, when we're communicating and we understand that it's like, oh, I know Susan knows that Bob only likes ketchup on his hamburger. Mm. Don't give him anything else. It's knowing all these little things about each other and right. understanding that. So it's really coming back to remembering that it's not this competition. This We're against each other. It's like coming back to that understanding and using effective communication methods to get there. Yeah. That subjective reality that remembering that that's that person's point of view, their core beliefs, and this is mine. How can we communicate around that? I think you said something that's really important for people to take a step back on during these conversations. And that was, let's say you're having an issue with a friend. If you weren't working on that friendship, you said that's going to come out in these types of conversations. Both of you are subconsciously aware that the relationships kind of on edge or whatever, correct? And then at that point, you're kind of taking it out on each other or? Yeah. So what happens is before I talked about, right, turning towards and making these grunts and acknowledging and all of those little things play into it. And so by that turning towards and creating the friendship. And so what happens is we start emotionally distancing because it's like these little fights or these disagreements seem to come out of nowhere. And it's like, I don't know what to say. And then so we start emotionally distancing. And the emotional distancing is where the friendship kind of starts to go a little astray. And we start living these parallel lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a little touchy, you don't know how to bring it up. And then the distancing starts. And I would imagine oftentimes when this is happening, a lot of people are like kind of shy away from these conversations, correct? They do. And the research shows And I think this just goes back to our biological wiring that we don't want to bring up sticky situations and men are really not very well inclined to do that. Yeah. And it comes down to when we get in this. Yeah. yeah, When we, so the women were, you know, in the tribal areas, they, you know, they were the nurturers. They were, they're, they're comfortable in these kind of messy emotions and things like that. And then when you're out there being the the hunter, emotions will get in the way, right? Mm-hmm. And so we've got this, this hard wiring. When we get in these tough conversations, there's something that 
can happen that we call diffuse physiological arousal or flooding. And so that's when the heart rate comes up, you know, and all of our hormones get flooded and our ability to really think has gone because we're in fight, flight, or freeze, right? Men in these situations are more likely to be flooded. And when we have that physiological result along with it, we're not really going to want to go into that battle, right? Right. And we're going to want to avoid it, which can cause, again, another miscommunication between the the male and female partner. It's just a chain effect that goes down the road. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that physiologic response. So you're having a conversation, be it with a friend, a spouse, significant other, coworker, whatever it may be. And typically those conversations can get heated and you have that physiologic response. So if that were to happen, what's the right thing or, you know, quote unquote, right thing to do in that moment, because usually those, again, don't end up being productive conversations. No, because we're we're now we're kind of like animals, right? Our yeah. ability to communicate, to uptake. The thing is, is to be able to identify, right? And so I even have couples take their pulse. I've got little pulse oximeters that we use in the office that send this little alarm <laughs> off, right? When, yeah, oh, it's for sure. And so That's the most awesome. effective thing to do is we stop. And it's like... So you have this conversation, this understanding, like, you know what? I'm really kind of, I'm triggered right now and you need some time. So you make an agreement with your partner. Okay. I need to, what we call self-soothe. And so that means time away, at least 20 minutes. And in that 20 minutes, you've got to do something that is enjoyable to you. You're not going to run the conversation of what you're going to say through your head because there's nothing soothing about that. That's not going to bring your physiological state back to a high functioning one. And maybe it's listening to music, maybe it's watching a TV show, whatever it is, and then have an agreed time to come back. And if you come back and you're like, we're not back in that state, then make another time. But it's got to be within the next 24 hours because that partner needs to know that you're not trying to like, oh yeah, tomorrow. And we know that's right. not going to happen. So we have to self-soothe. We have to get out of that state and we have to recognize when it happens. When I learned this concept of it's okay to take a break when you're heated as long as you can communicate that. You know, there are definitely times when there's a mutual, okay, let's go ahead and take this break because you both recognize it. And that one one person just wants to like, you know, keep on going. We need to do this right now. We need to do this right now. Yeah. And it is, it's it's awareness, right? (laughs) A lot of this does come down to awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing in working with couples that Sometimes just having some of these conversations and we haven't even really got into the work yet, they start kind of, if they're curious with each other and they're not, you know, deciding whether they want to leave or not, that's a whole different Yeah, it's a whole different game. thing. But the couples who are like, yeah, you know, things are not the way I'd like them to be. They start getting curious and start going, oh, doesn't that make, that's kind of interesting. That makes sense. So having just some awareness, having this knowledge is once you know that, like, it is a game changer. Just yeah. those simple little things like, oh, yeah, I want, you know, I've been in that place where, yeah, I want to take care of this right now, but it's because I've lost my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've lost my mind because of my hormones, my body has taken over. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you said, it's a physiologic response mm-hmm. and you can't. Right. Yeah, you, there's really, it, it's hard to ration at that point. And then we start building habits around it too. Mm. So having the awareness and taking the pulse and this awareness builds the structure in there. And once we get the habit, it's like, oh, okay, I can figure that out. Yeah. But it's, you know, there have been times when even in my knowingness, I'm watching myself and I'm like, oh my gosh, Sherry, this is not, this is not great. Right. And, but it's just like a runaway train. Yeah. Yeah. This goes to the physiologic response that we're talking about too. One of the other differences in people and and when there's conflict going on is you tend to have someone who is highly emotional, highly reactive, and then you have tend to have another person who's very logical. The mindset between those two also goes into play. So I'm not a very, I'm typically not a very reactive person. I'm more of the logical person in the, in those conversations, but that also doesn't do my partner justice who can be a reactive person. So what are some things to worry about? Like you know, me, me being logical and thinking, okay, we're in this argument. I'm calm the entire time because like I clearly have a progression of how this should go, you know, going back to like wanting to solve everything. Right. Mm-hmm. There's that aspect that that logical person can tend to take on. What are some fallacies behind being a, the logical person in that scenario, too, where it's not always, you know, that person isn't always right. And what are some instances or what are some things that that they need to realize as well? Well, I think, again, it comes back to the love maps and understanding that about your partner. And mm-hmm. so on both sides. 
and being able to communicate around it. And there's a lot of fun little exercises that couples can participate in to, to practice around that, right? And it's, it's that past therapies have been, you know, that active listening and things like that. And that's that really, sometimes that only can traumatize a relationship, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. If, if someone's really not saying nice things and just reflecting them back and, and things like that, it's just not carte blanche. But it's giving that opportunity to the partner to really be able to express themselves and then you reflecting back what it is exactly as they say it and creating understanding. So creating understanding before there's any kind of solution and really having that conversation and using a framework within to be able to have that conversation. And then it becomes practice and that's habit and it becomes second nature. Yeah, I like that. I know there are some things that you had, forgive me, I'm spacing the the term for them, but ultimately what the four horsemen are. The four horsemen, yeah, yes. You, you, uh, can you talk about that? The four horsemen of the apocalypse are four behaviors that John and Julie Gottman discovered in the Love Lab. It was really some of the first research-based marital therapy uh, methodology. And they found that, um, so these four behaviors, when they show up, were good predictors of a failing relationship. Now, it's not dire that these are things, if you see these things, every relationship, even good relationships have them. Again, it comes back around to how you manage them. And so we have criticism. And that's when someone is is putting, um, you know, well, you never take out the garbage rather than saying, you know, I would love it if you would take out the garbage. Yeah. And there's a couple of different causes for a partner being critical. It could be because that's how they grew up there. That was and sometimes an emotionally unresponsive partner will bring that that horseman up. Defensiveness. So defensiveness when someone is critical, usually you get defensiveness. But the defensiveness, the problem with that is it's like, I have no responsibility for it. It's an excuse, right? The antidote to that is like taking responsibility. Yeah, I didn't take out the garbage and here's why, you know, I should have done that. Okay. Stonewalling. Stonewalling is is related to this diffuse physiological arousal because you think, you know, when the, your body's going all crazy that, it, you know, you look like some crazy person. No, right. you can be sitting there like a stone wall, and that's usually what happens is like, just kind of turn everything off on the outside, the heartbeat, and there's no there's no response. Yeah, it's just this withdrawal, I'm, right? I'm guilty of this. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'm done with this conversation. I and, do that yeah. too, and you tune out, and it's it's really it it can really make, and especially someone who is looking for that feedback. Yeah, it's like it's like torture. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, for someone that uh, like my partner is more reactive, more emotional. So the second I just go like you know very mm-hmm. stoic phase, it just yeah. it's like pisses her off to no degree. And I, I do my best not to do it now being aware that I do it. Mm-hmm. But at the time I didn't, I wasn't aware to that degree that I did it. And it was just like, it was like the most detrimental thing I could do to her. I think being aware of that, that's is, is very important. It is. Yeah. And so stonewalling. And then, um, so we've done criticism. Oh, contempt, contempt. That is the most deadly, right? Because you're kind of on a high horse, mm. you know, like you have this air of superiority, like if only you had more discipline like I did, you know, by taking out the garbage. Right. That's pretty crushing on a person. Yeah. So, again, it comes down to how we communicate those using I statements, taking a partner's influence, de-escalating, self-soothing, all of these things that sound pretty accessible, really. Yeah. But it comes to awareness and practice and right. building habits. And these four horsemen, as you call them. These are behaviors that we can have during conflict, correct? And so the, that's that's a, right. a behavior that we adopt during conflict. So if we're having an issue or if we're having a conflict in a relationship, recognizing if we are doing one of these four things and then being aware of that, obviously, but by recognizing it and then from there going and switching it and like, you know, flipping a switch to ideally not perform those actions. What a fabulous point, Matt, because it's, let's recognize what we're doing. Like sometimes I'll work with a client and it's, I'll just work with one because the other partner doesn't want to come in. And I'm like, if you focus and you start changing and making yourself a better partner, your other partner will often just come along. Right. Right. Yeah. And so instead of saying, oh yeah, I'm going to focus on my partner's four horsemen. No, no, no. Yeah. Focus on your own. Only focus on what you can control. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I've done this before and it's still a work in progress to this day, but I, it's, I've, I found this to be extremely beneficial and empowering and, and ultimately it leads to productive conversations. And I think the biggest thing that I realized, cause I'm built 
mentally, I'm built to be like a problem solver. And so knowing that 69% of the issues that I'm going to face in arguments is not solvable. It's me just kind of working around what the expectations are, stuff like that. And connection, right? Yeah. Sometimes our partner, all they want to be is heard. Mm -hmm. There was this great training video that I had got to see um, years ago. And it was this woman and she's got a spike in her forehead. And the more masculine side of us wants to be the problem solver. And I can tend to be that way too. And so she's got this nail in her head and the husband just wants to say, and she's like, I feel a lot of pressure in my head. And it's like, it's really hurts. And he's, he's, he's just, you can see, he's really wanting to say, you got a nail in your head and take it out. But it was this, this whole thing of like him listening to her about this nail that she knew was there, but just needed the connection. Yeah, I, I love that video. I think it's I think it's <laughs> hilarious video, and it does drive me crazy sometimes when I'm like, "But you can you can solve the problem, but ultimately that's not what the." It's about connection. Yeah, it's it, deepening it really that is. friendship. It's like, are you in my corner mm-hmm. on my worst day? Are you able to put up with my garbage? And are you, and vice versa? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because it's gonna it's gonna show up. Going back and recapping some of the things we've talked about thus far, so. If you're having conflict in a relationship, step one, understanding if the problem is a solvable problem versus a perpetual ongoing problem. And I think probably before that is just kind of listening to what the issue is to begin with, right? Because right there, I went into problem solving mode of is this solvable, is it not? (laughs) And that's that's ultimately not going to be productive, especially if it's in the 69% issue. So listening to what the problem is, understanding is it solvable or is it an ongoing piece From there, I think really recognizing is this stemming from an issue in the relationship to begin with? So like you said, has there been emotional distancing between you and that person? Has there been some other tension, conflict that could be manifesting in this argument? If the argument does get heated, making sure that you self-soothe, so taking the pulse, doing deep breathing, whatever it may be. And then I think recognizing if you're if you're going and if you're going and getting heated, are you starting to take those the action of uh, the four horsemen on that? Actually, I'll let you repeat them okay. in, in order because I, I only remember stonewalling because that's the one I'm, I'm the most <laughs> yeah. guilty of. So okay, so we have criticism. Mm-hmm. That's not describe. It goes beyond describing what it is. It's like you didn't take out the garbage and you're lazy. Then there's the defensiveness. Well, I didn't take out the garbage because. You yelled at me, you know, and so there's that I don't have a responsibility in there. And then there's contempt that, you know, I am superior. You know, I have the discipline. You do not. And then the stonewalling. Yeah. It's like, all right, you can't get to me. Yeah. I'm off. Can't touch me. Yeah. And um, this just shutting down. So recognizing if those if you're doing any of those from there, if you're doing it, I can't imagine, and at least in my experience, it's really easy to come out of that right away. So usually the best thing is to say, hey, let's pause this conversation and let's get back to it at this time, you know, or like in two hours or something like that. You, you have to give a time. It has to be within 24 hours. That way, both parties feel like they were heard at least. And then going back and working on uh, tr- just trying to understand the situation again. Right. And, and using those. I feel so those I statements being, you know, being polite to your partner, giving appreciation and describing what's happening, not evaluating, judging, putting those that spin on it. So you can say things like I feel about what I need and in that being polite and and courteous, Mm -hmm. just like how you would treat a guest in your house. Yeah, this is our partner. And we tend to think, oh, they will put up with all of our garbage. And maybe we even see them as an extension of ourselves. And sometimes we don't talk to ourselves all that nice. Yeah. And we do that to our partner. But just remembering that this is a special relationship that we really want to cherish. And in order to do that, just kind of common politeness yeah. applies. I think one of the obvious questions that people might have is when they return to have this conversation, let's say they were successfully able to break away for 24 or you know, for the 24-hour period or within the 24-hour period, they come back to it likelihood of it getting heated again is that typically possible oh of course it yeah. just and it depends on the couple and how where they are in their ability and to use some of the tools yeah. that we we provide yeah right and that's why going to see someone really helps because you've got that person in the room that's like 
okay, Susan, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some of this behavior here. Let's go back to the soft startup. Let's, so it's really coaching them like, yeah. like a football coach, like, okay, here's what you need to do. Go back to the 50 yard line. And yeah. I don't know much about football, but um, <laughs> you know, so it, it is, it's that direction because when you don't know, you don't know. It takes a lot of practice. I mean, what you know, what we say sounds, or what we just talked about sounds simple enough, but I mean, I've been under this coaching for, I think, two years now. I'm still picking up. There's still nuances that I need to learn, different things like that. And ultimately, it's helped me communicate better within my relationships, and it's improved my relationships quite a bit. What's the difference between this approach versus like traditional couples counseling? Traditional couples counseling, one thing, it hasn't historically been based on research. This method is based on 40 years of research. We're looking at couples in the love lab. And traditional couples therapy has a bad record because it looks at conflict resolution. Well, conflict resolution isn't even possible. So oftentimes it can make things worse. Yeah. And it, it goes back to that stat that you said 69% right. of conflict so isn't it's solvable. Great for, it's great for the solvable stuff, but the other yeah. stuff just is. And so, of course, there's that part where we're going to reflectively listen and at the same time make some corrections along the way, yeah. you know, because just reflecting back, you know, I think you're a terrible person is really not, I, you know, you need that coach to say, okay, how are we going to put that in a, in a, in a, in a way that it makes it about you and how yeah. you feel and what you need to express in a positive way, not attacking. Have you typically found, so, uh, and uh, obviously, so we just talked about couples counseling mm-hmm. that we can go beyond that because you know you, you, the tools that that Sherry's going over here aren't just applied, just as we said before, they're not just applied to couples, they're applied to every relationship in your life. Let's say there is uh, a couple that's struggling. Is it usually best for them to go in together? Is it good for the for them to go separately? Or is it is it very dependent on the couple itself? In general, the best rule is for the couple actually to come in together. Mm-hmm. As a therapist, it's really important. You can't take sides. Yeah, 100%. Right? And you need to really be that neutral person. And so, and that couple needs to know there's that neutrality there. Mm-hmm. I always start off with a couple, generally. There have been times when it's been the other way, but we really, then we bring both people in. And then if I've been working with one person individually, I'll work with the other person individually for a while mm-hmm. so that we can trust that here's where I've got each other's back yeah. and I'm neutral. If I haven't been working with someone, I have the couple come in. What we do is we go through an assessment phase. Mm -hmm. I do a a long questionnaire. There's a lot of analysis that goes into it because it's like going to a doctor and then saying, oh, I've got a stomach ache. And you don't palpate. You don't take their temperature. You don't do anything else. You're just like, oh, here's the solution. Right. Because other things come up. So this assessment part. And then after that, we do, we separate and we do some individual stuff and then we come back together. And then if there are other things that are affecting the relationship, like say a partner has unresolved grief or another one has anger issues, we can work with those on the side as yeah. well. Yeah, no, and I, I think I think it's a really good approach. I know for me personally, like I, there was an aspect where I recognized that I needed the work, but I wasn't willing to go in together just mm-hmm. yet. I needed to work on myself first right. before I was, I could show up for yeah. my partner. And so that was the approach that I chose to take. I think it worked fantastic for me, but everyone's different. Everyone's different. Yeah. And it does. It's, there is really no one size fits all from a, a therapist point of view that that both coming in is a is a great way to start, but it really does work a lot the other way sometimes too. Yeah. And it just really comes into making sure that both partner feels okay. Yeah. That Matt was seeing this person first. They've got this relationship and I might be the outsider here. That will never make effective therapy. So at the end of the day, conflict resolution isn't the solution actually. No, okay. it's that's that's um, <laughs> Add flame to the fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and gasoline, yeah. Yeah, gasoline, uh, that's it. Again, going back, it, it goes back to not conflict resolution, but conflict management. Conflict management, yeah. Buildings, friendships, yeah, and shared meaning. Uh, awesome. Well, I think that wraps up everything for this episode. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh my gosh, we could talk for days, Matt, but yeah. no, I think we have done it. we've done a nice job here. Awesome, perfect. In the next episode, we're going to be discussing stress around your career, things that can be done uh, or within your job, things that can be done. Obviously, one of the biggest stresses that can happen in your job has to do with the relationships that you have within your job. So using the tools that we just talked about here is going to be beneficial to you. And we'll discuss some other topics uh, in that particular one. 
Sherry, thank you so much for being on this episode. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. Do you or someone you know experience joint pain? Our team at Ethos Sports Medicine loves to work with active individuals and help them avoid surgery and pain medications, eliminate joint pain, and stay active. Ask our team how you can get more information on our unique approach to joint pain so you can continue doing what you love.